and we're live and i did not do an intro because this was like last minute early rescheduling For i'm not i'm not sure if i would have done an intro anyway but I definitely didn't have time to do an intro today but hey we're here hello it's time to wet your plants with kelly and steven that's right and today we're going to talk about water chemistry yay yeah. And uh, why is water wet? Water is wet because it's both adhesive and cohesive because it has what's called a dipole moment. So water is a slightly charged molecule because oxygen, so water consists of an oxygen atom, two hydrogens. And the oxygen is really electronegative, meaning it pulls the electrons toward it. And so that gives it a slight negative charge on the O end of it. And then the other end has a slight positive charge. So because it's slightly charged, it can stick to things and it can dissolve not. things. And that's why water is wet. You did not even miss a beat with that question. <laughs> Man, I taught for a lot of years. Good Lord. I know. Good. Uh, so audio video check from people who are here because my stream yard is telling me the like the low signal connection unstable that kind of thing and i can't see who's here someone asked yeah so geek boy asked that explains why water is wet but why is matt always wet hmm. i mean i explain that Okay, so good audio video check. You look and sound great. I look like a douche as normal. All right, so we are ready to go. <laughs> hmm. So, water. So, I guess we should confess. Do you test your water all the time? I do. I never do anymore. I mean, I obviously tested at the beginning of... Well. Yeah, I should clarify that I don't test it in the most in the neurotic way that I used to. Yeah. But I'm still kind of like I've made a lot of changes recently with the uh like adding the second lights thanks to you. And now I'm like up in some CO2 in some of the tanks, thanks yeah. to you. And spending money thanks to me. Yeah. And so it just comes sometimes things like are out of balance. And when they're out of balance, you just want to, you know, make sure everything's all right and get them back in balance. So I've been testing macros a little more often than usual. Yeah. Could, true confession. I don't really test a whole lot. I mean, when I first set up tanks in this, this place, like this is new water to me. Um, I, so I did test and I, I do test when I set up a new aquarium, but I don't set up that many new aquariums. I have three. So mm. I have the two you're seeing. And then I have a tiny little tank I just set up for shrimp. Cool. So I don't test that up. But that's because nothing changes. I mean, these are really right. stable systems. So, and, and that's kind of the nice thing about once you get your planted tank settled in, um, it is really stable. And even though, I mean, I do have to, every time the CO2 empties out, put it you know, restart it again. Yep. You know, I do have to monitor then to make sure it's in place. But other than that, just goes, just goes. So how often are you going to get your CO2 refilled? I So I just bought a 10 pound cylinder. I have a five pound running. I had a five pound running those two, these two tanks. So on 90 mm. and 40. And I was running out of CO2 oh. like every six to eight weeks. Uh, and now, yeah, yeah. Ah, it's so annoying. So I just bought a 10 pound and I would have bought a 20 if they'd had one in stock because I think that 20 would fit under my stand. But yeah. I, I have a 20 on my 90 just so yeah, I don't have to worry nice. about it. That's nice. I do live two blocks from um, the place where I fill it and they fill it on site. So it's not that big of a deal, but mm. I can't change the CO2 by myself because um. I, I can't torque the bolt. My my wrist and hands are oh, dainty old, dainty hands. I can't. Too much knitting. <laughs> Too much. Too much typing. So I have to wait for the weekend when Jake does it. So that's that. But um, 
yeah, so I, I don't, don't test that frequently, but I do think that you need to understand your water and you do need to test at the beginning of setting up a tank because you're not, you can't be sure what your KH and GH are going to be, even though you know what your water is out of your tap, because most of us put stuff in our tank. We put substrate in, we put right. rocks in, we put wood in, and those things will change your GH and your KH. And that so, was one of those things that I was very careful about in the beginning is like every little thing that I put in my tank, I wanted to make, I like, I researched it and I'm like, what is this going to do to my tank? So I kind yeah. of had an idea of what was going to happen when I put it in my tank. Yeah. And there, there is a difference. So I have Sirius stone in this tank. And that raises my KH a bit. So the KH mm -hmm. is like a point higher in this one, which, you know, it all works out good. Like once, yeah, this isn't an equation. This is real life. And mm -hmm. there's a range that is acceptable to work. And it's within that range. But, you know, the KH is higher in this. So let's talk about KH and GH and P. Indeed. Because. Uh, yeah. Very people, important. Very important when it comes to growing plants and knowing what you can reasonably expect with plants and what you can be successful with. Exactly, because the most important of those three is your KH. I, well, they're all important, but your, your KH is kind of the one that's going to make or break you. So KH is a measure of your carbonate hardness. So carbonate and bicarbonate so mm -hmm. um so that would be an anion so that means a negatively charged ion so and it's co3 minus or hco3 minus is bicarbonate so a molecule you're all familiar with like is baking soda that's right. sodium bicarbonate and then sodium carbonate in fact i think i've got some in a little bag right is here is washing soda wow Sodium carbonate. Soda ash. Yeah. Sodium carbonate. Mm hmm So, and that's, that's um, Na. So, sodium is Na. Mm -hmm. And then CO3. So, it's a measure of that. And if I could have no carbonate in my water, I would. So, because I don't want fish that need it. What um, is it about carbonate that plants just do not crave. Well, so here's the thing. So carbonate is, is part of the, the carbonate bicarbonate buffer system for water. So what's a buffer? So a buffer is a molecule that can soak up pH changes. So let's think of it like it's a bucket. So let's say you have a leak in your roof, okay? And you don't want your floor to flood. You need to put a bucket under it. Now you could either put a teeny tiny bucket under it, or you can put a great big bucket. If you put a great big bucket under it, you're never going to notice any flooding in your house. So that's what your KH is. Now there are other things that buffer your tank too, but the carbonate system is one thing that can buffer it. I so, have another example of a thing that can buffer your tank that is not derived from sodium or calcium. Potassium I, carbonate. Yes. Yeah, so, but that's also carbonate. So phosphate right. also buffer your water and there's organic yeah. compounds that buffer your water. There's lots of things that buffer your water. So, but why we care about the carbonate system is because the lower your KH is, the more accessible CO2 is for plants. So think of it this way. If you have a great big, like big gulp cup, Okay, and you put half an inch of Coke in the bottom, kind of hard, and you, you're trying to drink out of it, like the Coke's all the way at the bottom, you can't drink it, right? But let's say right. you have a shot glass. You don't need to put much in the shot glass mm -hmm. to your drink of Coke out of there. Right. So the lower your KH is, 
and there's there's more complicated reasons behind that, but I think this is the easiest way to think about this. The lower your KH is, the less CO2 you have to put in to get your plants to grow. So for instance, there's a popular YouTuber who likes to use something he calls the low and slow method of CO2 injection. Well, he lives in a place where the water is super, super, super soft. He yeah, it's quite handy it. when your water comes out as RO exactly. and you decide what gets to go in it. Exactly. But I used to live in a place that had a KH of 22. Holy shit. You can turn your <laughs> CO2 on at like a stream in a 29 gallon tank. Yeah. And you will not get your pH meter to budge because that water is so buffered and it's a lot harder to grow plants. So what do you do about it? So Stephen and I both were able to grow plants. We don't have Seattle water. So my KH is six ish, depending on the tank, it's six coming out of the tap. And mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, this, this one is, I think seven or eight. This one is a little lower than six. Um, this one is probably about five. Um, okay. you know, I get stuff to grow in both of them just fine, but their plants I can't grow because they, they're fussy. Yeah. So, and they're, they're just soft water plants. As yeah. Well. So like, I'm, I've tried to grow Toninas. Can't do it. Yeah. Area, yeah. I've never tried area Collins. There's no point. Why would I spend the money? Yeah. My water is just not soft enough. I've seen that up for auction and then I researched it and I'm like, nope. It's not worth it. There's certain Ludwigias I can't grow because my water isn't soft enough, but I can grow plenty of plants. Now, back when I had cage of 22, my life was a lot harder. I could grow crypts, um, vals, and anubias, and java fern, and that was about it. <laughs> And that's the thing that makes them good beginner plants is because they're not so fussy that you have to pay right. attention to your water chemistry. It's one of those mm -hmm. things where you put it in your tank, you got nutritious substrate, you're fine. Yeah. And you don't and even need to inject CO2 if you don't want no. to. And they'll grow just fine. And, uh, but, you know, if you live in a place with softer water, your life is just easier. Um, so, if you want a lower KH, what do you do? Well, there's some things you can do. You could do RO water, and that gives you a blank slate. Um, maybe one day. Yeah, I mean, I'm not willing to do it, but maybe in my next house I will. Because, right, right. Um, you know, I'd kind of like to have a marine tank, but it's a lot of work. I don't know. I'm not willing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you can do... You, you can um, use something to reduce your KH. You can use an acidic substrate. So that's why aqua soils are so nice. ADA, Amazonia. Yeah, or Fluval stratum. Yeah. Or um, UNS Contra soil. Um, they do reduce your pH. Some Sometimes a, a soil tank, so a dirted tank, that might also reduce it. Just depends what what your dirt's like, you know? Yeah, I mean, any large amount of dissolving organics mm -hmm. uh, will will cut into your KH. You just kind of have yeah. to pay attention to the other stuff that's leaching into the tank, like ammonia and mm -hmm. excess nitrates. Yeah, um, so really any of those, those rotting organic matter. So um, they release tannic acid, which is an acid, and that's going to reduce your KH. It's also going to reduce your pH a little bit. Um, because KH and pH are directly correlated yep. in absence of anything else that will change your pH. So pH is just the negative log of H plus ions in the tank. So that's the concentration of the acid. So I did learn recently that while the KH and pH have that uh, correlation, if you have KH in the form of phosphate, it does not have the same correlation and you cannot determine pH based on your KH. So KH is not phosphate, but phosphate will affect pH. KH is only carbonate and bicarbonate. So KH only measures the carbonate and doesn't measure all buffer. No. There, there's a test strip. Buffer. 
that has alkalinity, uh, it has carbonate alkalinity and then total alkalinity. Yeah. So because total alkalinity is carbonate and bicarbonate, if I recall, and that's important to, um, people who keep reefs because they need to keep their water at a really mm. high pH where there's, so at lower pH is like, we keep our water. Um, most of the water, the, most of the carbonate exists as carbonate, not as bicarbonate, but in a reef, there's carbonate and bicarbonate and you need that high enough to build coral. So that's where that comes from. But phosphate is its own thing and phosphate can buffer your water. Um, you do need phosphate to grow plants. Your tap water might have some phosphate in it. Yeah, mine does. pH and KH are not directly correlated because there's usually something else buffering your water in there. But I don't really worry about pH that much. Like people talk about pH crashes. A planted tank is very stable and I inject CO2 every day. My pH lowers by a full point. And in, uh, in some instances, lowering it by 1.4 if you're an insane sure. person. Sure, some people do because their fish will tolerate it. Yeah, um, I mean, we'll think about in the wild at night, like the pH naturally lowers by that much just because of the plants mm -hmm. giving off CO2, like all yeah. around them. And the reason the CO2 reduces pH is because the CO2, when it's dissolved, forms carbonic acid. So like when you're drinking a Coke, it's an acidic thing. And that's because the dissolved CO2 forms carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. So I so, want to look at uh, Jason asked a good question. So total alkalinity is carbonate and bicarbonate and KH is just carbonates. Now, I know that the KH tests will also test bicarbonate. So it's not exactly maybe the KH is a like carbonate hardness is a misnomer. Because yeah, it's not are, testing are, just carbonate. Yeah, there are reef tests that I think will distinguish those two. And please don't quote me on this because I don't know. Um, but I just know that at our our pHs that we keep our fish, that most of the the carbonate or that the car dissolved carbon in the water exists as carbonate, not bicarbonate. So right. Because if they like if your city adds buffer to your water, it's almost definitely going to be soda ash. Yes. And so my city does that, for instance. And that's why the KH here out of the tap is six, which is not horrible. I mean, honestly, it's it's not that bad. And that's because they soften the water with uh, with lye or I'm sorry, not with lye, with um, with soda, soda ash. So you get sudsy bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why they do that. Because when I lived mm -hmm. in a place called Coralville, Iowa, I mean, listen to the name, the water comes out of the aquifer. <laughs> and it is so hard. And everybody has very, um, you know, a lot of lime scale building up in their washing machine and their pipes. And, you know, your hair never gets clean. And, you know, it's just mm -hmm. the world's hardest water. And I always had a, a line around that, you know, the water line around my tanks from when it evaporated. And that's because that water is so high in, in uh, carbonate, but also in calcium and magnesium. And that's what causes soap scum, by the way. So Imagine if your shower door looked like the uh, lid of your tank. Yeah, it was. Well, I, I mean, you know, you would just usually get a shower curtain and then you just throw it out every year because a shower door is never going to look good. Right. <laughs> Unless you get a that's, water. Filter. That's exactly what I do. It's just I'm not cleaning that shower curtain when it gets to that point. And it's just replace. <laughs> yeah, just throw it out. But the other thing that you can do. So you want to test your KH out of the tap. You want to test it in the tank because you need to look at what's in your tank because yeah. there might be something that's changing your KH. So aqua soil is going to, to bring it down. Dirt might bring it down. Wood might bring it down. Um, peat, if you do a black water setup, will bring it down. Peat will make it go down, down, down. Down, like, down, down. Yeah, you don't but need a lot of that. It'll also make your water look black which if that's your jam then 
but it also blocks light. So, you know, it's like, yeah, you kind of have to make a trade off. Do you want to do full black water Amazon tank or do you want a, a nice, not so natural garden? And I'm kind of in between, like I've got some tanks that I want to just be straight up displays and there's, you know, a certain level of work and maintenance involved in that. And then there's the natural ones. Yeah. But, and I keep Amazon fish. So mm -hmm. what do I care? Oh, and Di yeah. Diane says, did someone say Coralville, Iowa pebbles coming out of the faucet? Yeah, <laughs> but that's the truth. It's just really hard water there. It's like that in all of Iowa. But, um, you know, my city in Indiana softens the water with uh, with uh, sodium carbonate. So it's not so bad. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, but the other thing, culprits to look for, your rocks. Some rocks can raise your KH, um, and those are limestone rocks. So limestone is calcium carbonate, and that's most of the rock in the Midwest is, is limestone because if you live in Iowa, the reason it's called Coralville is Iowa was, uh, you know, it was part of, it was an ancient sea in the Midwest. And so all of those ancient sea creatures, when they died, they left their bodies behind and those bodies were made of calcium carbonate, which became coral fossils. So it's very <laughs> heavy in limestone. So right. most of the rocks, but um, you can test to see if your rocks are made of limestone by just putting a few drops of vinegar on them. And if they fizz, then you know um, that... Uh, you shouldn't use that rock. But Unless it's also worth it. noting that if you already have a good bit of buffer in your water, the rate at which that limestone is going to dissolve will be so like so slow that yeah. if you're trying to rapidly cool. raise your GH, for example, and your KH is already high, that's not going to do it. Like that's not your your yeah. solution. And when I lived in Iowa, I put limestone in my tank because who cares? That water couldn't get any harder. What did it even matter? Right. I mean, it just didn't matter at that point. So, um, but if you're trying to make it lower, don't make your life harder. The other thing that can make your water, your KH higher is sand. Some sand, uh, just test it. It's like if it's a ragonite sand mm. or some beach sands, it's going to raise it. Um, that's why a lot of people really like the black diamond blasting sand that you can get from Home Depot and that's glass. Yeah. And so that's so, making sense. Right. Um, so. So, oh, I saw a question. Why would hot water and cold water yeah. so much different? There's a, well, so I want to say there's a crap ton of questions uh, coming through. Uh, Eduardo's about to have an aneurysm because we're not uh, reading chat. So I guess at some Sorry. point without, we haven't really discussed like the format, of it, but I guess at some point we probably have to go to the chat and start. Yeah, at some questions. point, but I'll answer that one. Um, okay. So, so your KH and your GH can measure differently on hot, on hot water because your water, your water heater has all sorts of dissolved crap in it. I mean, especially if you live in the Midwest, all those minerals will precipitate out and they'll build up. And then they, the hot water will dissolve them, and then that will come out of your tap. So, I would also like to add to that: um, if you have a cheap ass TDS meter, like I do, I well, it was like twelve bucks. Yeah, it does not do a very good job of compensating for temperature. Mm -hmm. And if your temperature of the water is high. The ions are moving rapidly, and so your P yeah. your TDS meter will is going to pick up way more uh, conductivity versus yeah. very cold water. And that's true of pH too. So pH is right. a temperature dependent measurement. So whenever pH is defined, it's always defined as twenty five degrees Celsius, which is like room temperature. So um, I see. I'll read some chats. So Snoochie yeah. Booch says, "I only tested phosphates hot." was 10 ppm and cold was 1 ppm. It doesn't surprise me. All sorts of things will precipitate out in your water heater. Yeah. And then as it heats up, it'll dissolve. So, right. um, you know, that's just a, a thing. Um, 
I mean, I don't fill my tanks with cold water. Some people do. Some people do water changes cold and they let their heaters heat it back up and their fish are fine. I don't. No, I do straight from the tap with, uh, you know, I balance it out with the hot water and cold and just let it. Yeah, I do too. I do such big water changes, but yeah. I mean, I've heard people do it both ways. Some fish are kind of excited by cold water change. I know some quarries will spawn, mm -hmm. but I don't do it that way. But And rainbows just like new water regardless. They do. They love clean water. There's. I just changed the water in this yesterday. And they look so good. They look so good. So, yeah. I mean, what else do we want to say about KH and GH? So, GH, we haven't talked about that. So, GH is calcium and magnesium. Um, your Hold on. Let's, uh, let's address this, Eduardo, because he really wants oh, visual, no, sorry, visual aids. Because he's like me. I'm a very visual learner. And so if I were learning this stuff for the first time, hearing it said to me verbally would be kind of in one ear and out the other. So, Eduardo, I'm going to send you to a website. And it's called nice. Two Hour Aquarist. So number I love two, that site. Love eight that site. Our Aquarist, all one word, dot com. That's an awesome website. That guy is a really good writer. He he explains things really well. So that's where I would go to our Aquarist. Yep. And it's very accurate information, yeah. too. The yeah. only thing that, that kind of annoys me about that site, and it doesn't really matter to me because I don't buy their fertilizers, but I don't like the way they advertise and market their fertilizers. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean... I've never tried his fertilizers. They're fine. But here's here's the truth. Fertilizers are fine. Use Easy Green if you want. Use dry ones if you want. Use Nylock G if you want. As long as you're not, like, using ones that are, like, water, like Seachem ones. Mm, yeah, just to waste your money. So yeah. unconcentrated. Just use whatever. It's fine. Like, people yeah. overthink fertilizer when they should be thinking of kh so gh your water so gh is calcium and magnesium so that's a cation which means those are positively charged ions you need some for your plants that plants are happy with a pretty wide variety of gh your fish however and your snails might need different things rainbows yeah, I mean, you're, in general, your fish need more of it than your plants by far. So whatever amount that you're putting in for your fish are going to be way more than yeah. enough for plants. And plants are not going to throw a fit over too much. Yeah, so I I have a friend who is, he's better at this than I am. He uses RO water in his tank. And he, honest to God, runs his tank at KH0. And then he boosts the GH only. He uses a GH booster, which is um, calcium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. He adds that, and that'll raise the GH to, I think, mm -hmm. I think he raises it to like two or three degrees. Yeah. And that's it. He run, uh, He seriously runs his tank at KH0, but he keeps rainbows. They don't care. Right. And I cannot tell you, your fish may care. Like they may want some KH. Your snails for sure will care. Like my snails right. don't have great looking shells. But if cichlids care, care too. Cichlids care. African cichlids rather. Yeah. African cichlids care a lot. They want hard, hard. That's why people in Iowa really love them. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have to do a thing to their water and they are happy. So, right. yeah, and Atkins Nature Aquarium says that just me or rainbow fish not get enough credit as being one of the hardy. Oh, when someone says they don't like rainbows because of the shape, I rage. I want to fight. I love their shape. I know. They're super hardy. They're super hardy. They like clean water. They like big water changes and clean water. But Yeah, and it's not like you have to match the wild because, like, yeah. when's the last time you've you've gotten a wild-caught rainbow fish? Like, they're all USA bred at yeah. this point. Yeah, and, you know, I have friends breeding rainbows out in Seattle. Gary Lang, he, his water is pretty soft. I think his cage out of the tap is, like, two, um, two or three. So their water is pretty soft. Um, you know, it's... Uh, they're pretty, they're pretty, they're pretty cool with a lot of things. 
So should we take some more chat questions? Yep. Someone was asking who you were, so I just turned on the name tags. <laughs> Here we go. So, so I I I had I don't have a YouTube channel. I'm just uh, just a person. But I I have a PhD in molecular biology. I'm not a fish biologist. I'm not a plant biologist. I have a BA in creative writing. <laughs> <laughs> so useful. There you go. Yeah, needless to say, I I worked in uh, I work in management now. <laughs> so. Well, I sold my soul at corporate America too. So yay. But I used to be a professor and I used to teach. Um, so I taught all kinds of biology classes, but I taught mostly genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, evolution, microbiology, immunology, cell biology, never anatomy or physiology. Yes. Ever. Quick question. So when selecting dry ferts, I have the option of potassium and nitrate, phosphate, sulfate. Which one should I be using to supplement the lack of potassium in my tap water? Um, so potassium, uh, I think it's, isn't it potassium sulfate? Let me. Yeah. That's the one where if you have enough nitrate, you have enough phosphate, that's the one you want to put in there. It's the yeah. most, it, not that potassium is all that soluble, but it is the most soluble of the, uh, potassiums that you can yeah. get. So I'll show you what I have. I have potassium sulfate right here. Oh, fancy bottle. I just get well, it in a five pound bag. Well, but at least I got these. I got these because I like the containers and then I could refill them if I wanted. And yeah. this is mono potassium phosphate. And then I have. So I also have um, potassium nitrate. And this is. Um, trace elements right here so i can add all those but honestly i'm super lazy about fertilizing um and i i will just use easy green a lot of times because i don't have a lot of tanks um or i'll use nylock g makes an all-in-one and you know it's fine I, I, yeah I, I have thrive i have easy green i have all of the nylock g dry ferts yeah, and I have to feed really heavy because I these tanks are overstocked. Yep. Um, and I use these aqua soils, which they have what's called a cation exchange coefficient, which means that they will pull cations. So cations are positively charged mm. ions. They'll pull them out of the water to your roots. So you kind of have like a little bit of a little bit of cheat waiver in there. And so you can kind of get away with being, I don't know, a little less consistent near your, you still have to fertilize, but you know, yeah. I'm not like sitting there. Like I used to like measure out spoonfuls of fertilizer every week and you know, I don't, don't really do that as much. So if you are intimidated by fertilizer, just get yourself like some easy green or Nylock G just yeah. walk package directions and i think especially when you're starting a planted tank fertilizing at the roots is usually the best start instead of doing the water column just so you're not promoting algae in places you don't want it to be and that's kind yeah, of what I mean, i've been especially if you're using one of those inert substrates so if you're using mm -hmm. sand or you're using gravel or i mean unless you're using an aqua soil or dirt but if you have an aqua soil or dirt, you, I, for, in my opinion, like immediately fertilizing the water column while you have the aqua soil and dirt is just kind of inviting algae while the plants are settling in for a new setup. Yeah, I mean, I, I fertilize mine when I set up. Um, you know, I just don't fertilize super heavy. But yeah. I, I would just not. Fertilizer is important. But I would say in the hierarchy of importance, the most important thing to work on is your light. So getting mm -hmm. enough light is not that hard anymore. It used to be back when I started doing this like 15 years ago because there were no LED lights. So good lights were expensive and yeah. it was difficult. So sufficient light and not too much light. 
So, you know, these flu vol lights, you can program them down. Other ones, get them on a timer and don't blast the shit out of your tanks. Like start them at just <laughs> start them at like six or eight hours to start. Mm -hmm. um, and then raise them gradually from there. Um, so and that's and why I like the Fluval 3.0s is because if I want a longer photo period, I just do like a very, very dim in the morning. And then just mm -hmm. kind of whenever I'm ready for the peak yeah, lighting, just ramp so right up. Gradual ramp up and gradual ramp down. And I do that too. Second most important thing is your KH and CO2. I put those on the same level because they are hand in hand. Yeah. Um, you know, they're... Get your cage as low as you reasonably can. You may have fish that require a certain need. And I can't, I don't know every fish, so I can't tell you that for sure. I can just say for plants, though, as low as you can go, as low as you can go. And then your CO2, if you inject CO2, you want to get sufficient levels in there. And we can talk maybe next week or another week about what sufficient levels of CO2 are if you decide to do that. But otherwise, just try to get your KH a little lower. Even if you're not injecting CO2, do what you can. Yeah. Um, and then after you've worried about all that, then think about fertilizer. Yeah. So light CO2, KH, happy plants. And honestly, from what I've been reading about KH in general, there aren't many fish that like require this super alkaline water like they're they have a very wide ph range especially you've yeah. got your you got aquarium bred fish they're all kind of 6.5 to 8.5 you know yeah i think i remember dan saying that just the rift lake cichlids yeah you really need hard 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 water um, so what's considered a low KH minus four? I would say that's not bad, Ginger. Yeah, that's, that's good. Pretty, that's I would, I would good. That. I, would, I would like that. You can grow a lot of things. There's there are a couple things you can't grow, but you can grow almost everything. Like I'm pretty just don't do anything to make it harder. And yeah, you've got great water. Yeah. Way to go. Good job, Ginger. Yeah, way to go. So yeah, I mean, and honestly, Stephen and I don't have that bad of water either. Yeah. I have worse. Yeah, I mean, I would say with ours, is six or seven degree KH. I mean, 95% of plants are going to do fine. Sure. And Just I mean, I actually ambitious. Don't really, I don't really like those fussy stem plants. I think that, I think crypts look better. I think java ferns look better. And I don't want to trim that much every week. I mean, as is, it takes me a long time to take care of these, these tanks. And if you do tank after tank after tank of stem plants, like, you're going to go crazy. This is I haven't gone crazy yeah. yet. I'll say yeah. that. I'm still on the stage where I am enjoying it. Um, and wow. I'm fine with doing the maintenance and the trimming and the cleaning and yeah. stuff. With the, with the plants I grow... I do one giant crypt pull and trim every month, pretty much. Cool. So, you know, so what plants are recommended to keep in high pH for snail tanks? Um, I would go with crypts, java ferns, anubias, um, valisneria. I would go with anything that's a so-called easy plant. Boost. So mosses, mosses boost will do well. What about bulbitis? Um, probably bulbitis would be fine. It's a little harder for people to find, but yeah, I would go with that. Anything that's called an easy plant is probably a good choice because you need you do need to keep your your pH high and your KH high for your snails because uh, you want your snail shells to look good. So if right. that's your you know life is about trade offs. Um, yeah, Paul Bidas, you sent me is going nuts. Yeah, I love that stuff. I love that plant. I've divided it twice now, and it's like taking wow. over. Yeah, I've I've given that to a lot of people because it gets really big, but it's a great plant. They have a mini form of it. I'd like to get some of that, cool. but it's a little harder to get. So, yeah. So, what are some other questions in the chat? You need since Dee Dee is getting plants from you. Um, since she won that big auction, 
She just said her cage is 17 in most tapes. Yeah. You need to get with her and, and work know, with her to lower it. Dee 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 has emailed me. Yeah. And yeah, we got to get her key cage down. So I would I think that's right there is what's going to like to know what her. So, Oh, ginger says her GH is 17. That's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, your GH plants are very tolerant of a wide range of GH. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. You might have like a little bit of like hard water scale on the rim of your tank. And, you know, maybe you probably have a lot of soap scum in your shower. I imagine. But that's all yeah. good. So, yeah, I I wonder if the sand in Dee Dee's tank is raising her cage. Aragonite sand. Yeah, I do wonder, but I, I want to know what her KH is out of the tap. Well, I could, because she is also injecting CO2. She has some kind of uh, some kind of calcium carbonate substrate in her tank with injected CO2. It's going to wreak havoc. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so there you go, Didi. We're, we're going to fix that. <laughs> we're going to we're going to get you. We're going to get you fixed up, Didi. We're going to do it. Yeah. But 17 of a KH. That sucks. That's tough times, man. That's tough times. I think anything over KH of 12, I'm going to say, is my arbitrary cutoff for like. It's tough times. It's tough times. Yeah. And so if you ever change cities, you're going to be like, all right, I got to measure the tap yeah. water before we even think so, about buying this house. Yeah. So, Didi, your, your KH is 17 out of the tap. The tap. Ooh. Well, so the good news is the plants I've sent you uh, are all easy. So they're ones that can still do okay. I would just get your CO2 turned up as high as you can. And I would get something in there to try to take it down a little. Like investing in aqua soil, it's expensive. I get it. Um, yeah. I'm not saying ADA brand necessarily. There are lots of brands. Um, I've personally used Fluval Stratum. I've used UNS Contra Soil. So how long have you used uh, Fluval Stratum? Two years almost. And is it still is it still producing results for you? Because yeah, I mean, uh, Ian Atkins told me uh, that it only lasts about a year. Well, this has been going almost two years. And I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, it looks great. I mean, so I have my, my friend who runs his tanks at KH0. He's a very high performing tank, grows a lot of stems, really pushing the CO2 high. So he recently just redid his tank because after two years, he said that the aqua soil was not performing as well. Uh, but he's like more of a perfectionist than I am. And I don't even. There ain't no way I'm changing substrate if it goes inert. It, I'll just start putting root tabs down in there. Yeah. And it, it's inert. I mean, I don't know. All I know is this this tank is not slowed down. I mean, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it, anything you can do to get it a little lower, but otherwise you've got to really turn your CO2 up high. Not too high, Greg. Check your pH for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, oh, and the other thing is, I mean, I think maybe we'll talk about this more another time. Mm -hmm. You've got to watch your fish. Yeah, for because sure. Because it does not matter what your pH meter says and what some chart says. You have to watch your fish. Some fish are fussy. Yep, they'll go sulk and at the in the corner. They'll go up into the into the surface, start gasping like they're dying. They'll, and then if you're get to the point that I got where I was asleep when all that was happening. Like even the, the corridors were passed out, you know, and the, there and the rainbows, of, unfortunately, yeah. were just I mean, there are a lot of people who, when they turn their CO2 on, they don't even get out the pH meter. They just, just watch the fish. And then if they look a little fussy, they turn it down. Um, so, I mean, it, some fish are more sensitive. So I, someone just said, uh, I always read zero nitrite. Should I be dosing nitrogen? I don't want my nitrates to go above 40. So I worry if I dose nitrogen at my nitrates. So, um, nitro, oh, nitrite, um, you want nitrite to be zero. Oh, you can yeah. have 40 nitrates. You could probably 
if 50 or 60, I change my water every week. So I don't got to worry about that. I mean, that's why yeah. we do water changes. I change like 75% every week. Your plant I mean, will suck up all of that nitrate. I mean, I have never, when I do tests, unless I just dosed it, I can't. I can't really measure above 10 or 20 ppm. The plants are sucking. I have plants growing out of the top of this tank too. Mm -hmm. So they're going to suck it up. If you've got healthy growing plants, even without CO2, they're going to suck it up. So if you are, you may have to add nitrate. I mean, if you, you know, your plants do need it and your fish won't find it. Just use something like Easy Green according to the package directions. Start there. Right. And so, and that's the other thing too, is like if you are, plants love water changes. So if you want to keep an algae-free, beautiful planet tank, you got to yeah. be prepared to change your water and change it often and, and mm -hmm. massive water changes. Yeah, because I can, yeah. I can guarantee you if there is a beautiful planted tank you see on the internet, I guarantee you they're doing a lot of water changes. Some of them are doing it twice a week, like 30% twice a week. All the aquascapers who win the competitions, they they change a lot of water. Yep. And and their tanks are always like like criminally understocked. Like yeah. I would never keep a tank like that. I so wouldn't just, care because they I'm so, I need more rainbows in my life. Yeah. But so, yeah, uh, there is no such thing as tanks that look like, like ours that are just like set it and yeah. forget it. I mean, I can understand if you live in a place with droughts. I don't. Yeah. We I live in a place with floods. So yeah, um, me too. You know, but if you live in a place like, you know, Southern California that's in a terrible drought, I get that. Like I get why you would want to change water less. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's some fish that don't like water changes, not the ones I keep. But if you keep like rainbows and corridoras and loaches and they love water changes. So, um, you know, there's a reason I only have two tanks. Like, you know, it it takes time. Yeah. <laughs> Change water <laughs> daily. All tanks are ever stocked. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, I would recommend growing some plants out the tops of your tanks, Diane. Because I do that on this one. I have um pothos and I have I have a bunch of things growing out the top of that. I just got pothos <laughs> yesterday. Oh, that's good. I have some philodendrons and I have uh Caladiums, yeah, that's it's pretty, it's pretty good. Wow. So your cat doesn't bother the pothos. I was so afraid, like having well, animals in the house that the cats don't really jump up there for some right. reason. But my cats will murder. Well, my one cat, he'll murder every single house plant except the ones growing out the top of my tank. He's a murderer. That's why I don't have any house plants anymore. So yeah, but let's see. Do floating plants have a dependency more on nutrients in the water or the light provided to them? Or is it a combination? Why some floating floating plants die and some, and okay. So floating plants, um, floating plants will just suck up so much nutrients because they, they can grow really quickly because they are not limited for CO2. They are out of the water. And so they have access to all the CO2 in the world. So their limiting reagent is how much nitrogen they can, or and phosphates and potassium and all that, they can suck out of your tank. Um, sometimes floating plants, um, you know, they may not do well if you have a lid, if they're not getting good circulation. Maybe they're burned a little bit by the lights if it's too yeah. hot. Some um, of them also hate flow. Like they Plus, don't want any don't. kind of Why I anymore. never get any duckweed because I have so much flow. I've never been able spray to spray bar for the win. <laughs> I've never been able to grow duckweed. Um, I have grown a lot of floating plants outside. I don't grow them inside because here's the thing: floating plants block your light. So um 
you you can't grow anything on the bottom if you're blocking all the light from the top. Oh, and yep. Brooklyn Bell mentions the potho carry. That's what I use. I use that to grow plants out the top of my tank. You can get them on. It's Etsy. really cool. She brought me one yesterday yeah. with pothos in it. Yeah, those are on Etsy, and they are they're fun. So I lots I've, of cool stuff on Etsy. Yeah, makes so me want to get a three D printer. Yeah, yeah. So when testing water, should the tank water be room temperature before testing? You know what? Your tank temperature is close enough to room temperature. It's fine. Yeah. So I will say that digital meters, uh, this just applies to the electronic ones, usually are calibrated for 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But a decent one is going to compensate without you, like, without well, you having to, like, do it yourself, do the math yourself. Well, and um, here's... Here's the other thing. As someone who's worked in labs for a million years, there are no decent pH meters. They're all shit. I have used $10,000. <laughs> Amen to that. I've used $10,000 pH meters and they all suck. Like, that's just that. And the ones that you buy on Amazon, they suck too. They all suck. They're all inaccurate. That's why you need to rely on things like your eyes. You need to watch your fish. Mm. You need to watch your plants. You need to pay attention because you're those $12 pH meters. <laughs> I have a $30 pH. Well, meter well. Yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's not bad. So I've noticed the $12 pH meters, they read really, really fast. And I'm like, no bullshit. There's huh. no way you, you, uh, you got this number fat that fast. Yeah, the $30 one takes about 30 seconds to a minute, and it is closer to my liquid test and my strips than the other one. Here's the thing none of those little dip pH meters are calibrated. Right. I would never in the lab use a pH meter that I didn't calibrate with at least one point of reference. So you uh, buy they, calibration reference solutions the pH 7, yeah, one yellow, definitely. the pH. I think it's like 10, one or they all come with that at least. And yeah. I actually bought oh. more of it so I could calibrate it, it like monthly whenever I am using it. And then I bought wow. that. What they don't say in the instructions is how important it is to keep that freaking electrode thing wet. Like yeah, the in the lab, you actually store the probe in a super super saturated solution of yeah. potassium chloride. I think that's what I got. I got yeah, a bottle of that. They just you they give you a storage solution. So Eduardo says thank you for the stream. Oh, that you're gonna love that website too. The two hour yeah. aquarist, Eduardo. It's really great. So, yeah. And yeah. Eduardo, I am working on a video explaining KH, GH, and PH, and I like visual aids, so that will come out eventually. Yeah. I'm more of a verbal person. I like to read things. Yeah, so, reading and seeing it, or hearing it and seeing it. Um, is, I, I just I understand it faster if I can see it. Yeah, I have to read things. So, but I, or I can say things too. That's good too. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see. So Alishan says calibrate 10, 7, and 4. Yeah, that's if you're not like a dirty lab scientist like I am and you calibrate <laughs> 7 because you're dirty and have bad lab practices. But I'm not a biochemist. I'm a geneticist. And uh -huh. Just dirtier people. So, yeah. Let's see. Any other good questions? So do you want nitrites in a planted tank? You oh, wait. No nitrites. Because oh, yeah, I think he asked this. bad for your fish. Um, and your plants, even if you had nitrite, I could probably put ammonia in this tank and it would disappear. My plants would just suck it up. But right. I mean, ide ideally, ammonia is the best form uh, of nitrogen oh, to yeah. put in there because it's a most efficiently absorbed. It's just, you know, fish are not fans of it. Yeah. I mean, if I were to, I've heard of people keeping plants in tanks before with no livestock and they just crank the CO2 sky high and they fertilize with ammonia. And you might as well just have an, a garden like but outside. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to do that because I love my fish. I mean, yeah. my rainbows are so beautiful. I mean, that's not very fun. So, yeah. So what else do we have for questions in the chat? So we 
got six minutes. Let's see. Only Oscar says my cats will leave the plants alone if I give them a planter with just soil. They make a mess of it, but my plants are ignored. So Fat Kitty, <laughs> what he does is he will shred anything that's grassy. So I had this really beautiful um, ponytail palm. Oh, such a beautiful plant. And then I got that fat piece of shit off the street. <laughs> And I'm like, you were a free cat. Could send you back out there. You cost me zero dollars. So yeah, that's that's not gonna work. Well, yeah. So let's see what other questions we have. Uh what's the, oh, that's the question to Geek Boy about a plant that he's got? Broad waxy leaves. Like a red, dark green. Hmm. Is it, that in your tank? is it uh, is it an Amazon sword? Because like I have an Amazon sword right there that has really broad waxy leaves. Let's see if I can bring you in to see it. Uh, and then Crypt Keeper is asking what fish are in the tank behind me. Well, uh, some cheap ass mutt rainbow fish from Petco, um, which I still love for what they are. I'm just not ever going to breed them, and I'm not going to cry too much when they die. Yeah. And then some... We'll probably live forever. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're going to live like 20 yeah. years. And, and um, I have only rainbows. Pretty, I have some other fish, but mostly our rainbows. And I'm a snob. All my rainbows have pedigrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the McCulloch's in there as well. Oh, those are beautiful which fish. I treasure those. And then I've got a black angel fish in there and some autosynclus, some bronze corridoras, and some zebra loaches that you'll never see until feeding time. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I have some other fish besides rainbows, but I regret every fish I buy that isn't a rainbow because it means I could have just bought another rainbow. So <laughs> I like uh, Alishan says he hasn't checked his water parameters in 50 years. Yeah, man. If you've got your tanks dialed in, you can just, yeah, um, you can use your eyes, you know? Yeah, exactly. If you don't need to test your water, you don't need to test your water. It's just, I mean, everything's working. I never test the water on this tank. It's fine. I mean, there are seasonal changes in it. So my house has really crappy air conditioning and it gets really, really hot in the summer and like just doesn't look as good. Like the crypts look like trash. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it does go through changes, but I don't test the water in it. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. Everything's fine. No, I mean, if you use, if you know what you're doing and you're experienced and your tanks look good, what's testing the water going to get you? Yeah. And they're like, there's no problems. And what are you looking for? You're looking for a problem. Like if it doesn't exist. Exactly. exactly. Then you see something that doesn't sound ideal and you start chasing that parameter, even though like there was no reason to in the first place. Yeah. You only need to test water if your setup is new or you're unhappy with how something is going or you have fish dying or plants dying or algae like choked up. I mean, you know, or you change something big. Like if I were to go through this and like, I don't know, rip out every crypt and, you know, maybe I would change then or test it then, but I'm pretty lazy about testing. So yeah. Um, I haven't even, I've had that plant farm set up now for a little bit. I haven't got the, I, I have the CO2 cylinder coming uh, next week and the um, Alachan sending me the, the regulator that I got. Oh, so yeah, that's I'll great. start that going. But yeah, I haven't tested anything and plants are still growing. It's just, you know, the the all the Ludwigia sprouting green leaves because it likes CO2 to, to Yeah, it does. To yeah, I have a brand new tank. And I was gonna keep it with no CO2, but then you see how slow the plants are growing and how much better they could look and Better. So I'm going to put CO2 on You got to use that uh, ADA soil to its full potential. Yeah, this one has UNS Contra soil in it, which I really, really like. I, oh, I thought I, you got the ADA for some reason. No, this is UNS Contra soil, and I like it. It has um, 
it has a finer grain. I got the fine. There's also an extra fine I could have gotten, but I got the fine and it just holds roots better. The Fluval stratum, it works great, but it's really light. It's harder to keep things planted. I cap all of I mine. I do like it. And the price was comparable. I mm. don't cap soil. That's, that's no. Cause you don't like the mixing. No, because they just mix. That's I've gone down that road. I'm not. Then you just you got to cover up all of your uh, substrate with plants so you don't even see it. Yeah, I mean mine is all covered up, but like if you yeah. pull, I have to pull crypts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. True. No, I'm I've gone down that road. I'm no no layered substrates. No. Yep. No. I'm 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 a fan of them. I just like the different the benefits of the different ones, but you know, mostly. You know, you may You've been doing this a lot longer than me, and so I have to go through all these stages and try things out. No, you gotta, and... you gotta try it for yourself because I've gone through different substrates. I've gone through budget substrates because I was a poor graduate student when I started doing this, and yeah, I mean, you just gotta. I tried some budget options, and now I don't. <laughs> it's worth the money. <laughs> and that hour went fast as hell. <laughs> Dead. Well, we'll do it again next week. So, who's next? Fantastic. Austin, Fantastic Freaks. Uh, one of our mods will put yeah. them in the chat. I, I'm not, I won't, I'm lazy mod. So, yep. Just yeah. mod in name only. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. This was fun. Thank you so much for for hanging out with us yeah thanks everybody and everyone who's lurking and taking notes and replay crew all of them beautiful people appreciate it and we had like 60 something people in here so and, uh, you yeah. know if you have a topic you want us to talk about let steven know mm -hmm. we'll we'll do a different topic next week oh yeah i got a long list so yeah whatever you want to add to it we'll <sighs> cover it all i've got no plans i'll talk about whatever Cool. So. All righty. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.